and welcome to the Legatum Institute. I'm Sian Hansen, the Executive Director, and we are delighted to be hosting the Home Secretary tonight and supporting Women to Win. Now, for those of you who don't know much about the Legatum Institute, uh, we are an international think tank and we focus on promoting prosperity. Now, we do that through our research and particularly research in our core theme, which is revitalizing capitalism and democracy. For example, we have many programs. One of them is Tim Montgomery's Reclaiming Capitalism as a Force for Good. We're delighted you're all here. If you need to know anything more about the Institute, just grab me afterwards. We have many events, but I'm sure tonight will be one of the best. So put your hands together. Good evening, everyone. I think some of you will know me as the one who emails you all the time. My name's Gresham. I've worked for Women Twin for over two years now. And I'm also the candidate for Dulwich and West Norwood. So <laughs> yes. So um, I've had uh, the ability to see the good that Women to Win does from both sides of things as a candidate and as someone who has seen the training that everyone gets and what opportunities we provide in terms of funding, training for general election days, how to write a leaflet, all that kind of thing. Uh, when you're a candidate for the first time, uh, you suddenly find yourself thrown into the deep end. You're asked about what leaflets you should do, how you should fundraise, what you want to spend your money on, canvassing, door knocking. And I know that people like Anne uh, and Guy and Brooks, who I see in the back there, and Ellen have all been so supportive of the work that candidates are doing for the Conservative Party. I'm so pleased that we're here today to hear from the wonderful Home Secretary because she is someone who has done so well in Parliament and I know that many of the female candidates in this room today will see her as an example of where we could be one day with enough hard work and campaigning. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I started stuffing envelopes. So there you go. <laughs> so there's hope for me yet then. Um, so if you look around the room, there's lots of people with blue rosettes on. These are all candidates. So if you have any questions about what we're doing or how you can be of any help through stuffing envelopes or knocking on doors for us, I'm sure we'd all be grateful. And thank you to all of you, because without you helping us, we couldn't be doing the work that we're doing. So I hope you have a wonderful evening. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Theresa May, our Secretary of State for the Home Office, and Eve Pollard, who has achieved great things in the field, field of politics. Uh, sorry, <laughs> the bit of presenting, so it's hot, I'm getting nervous. Um, but I, <laughs> I hope you all have a wonderful evening and enjoy the in conversation with them. Please do talk to all the candidates about what they're doing so you know how you're helping us. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I, I first of all want to thank Teresa, who has had a jolly busy day today and um, who is, of course, the longest-running Home Secretary for over 50 years. Um, I've done this in two parts because I really wanted this to be informative and help all those ladies out there with blue rosettes in particular. So we'll start by that, and then I hope we'll have some fun later. Uh, there will be a chance for you to ask your own questions um, at the end, and we'll give you a signal so that if you're dying to ask the Home Secretary something, you can. Um, now, let's go back to when you were elected. Can I just ask you, you, you come from a political family or a family that discussed politics? Not a political family, a family that discussed politics. I'm an only child, and so I was brought up um, very much in that sort of adult world, my parents always watched the news, and so that sort of what was Sunday happening, lunch, current affairs talk. were yes was part of the sort of um, discussions that took place. And were they conservative of the big C or a small C or both C's? Um, they were conservative voters, but my father was a clergyman. I'm from a um, vicarage, child of a vicarage, and he had a very clear view that his job was for the whole of his parish. And so he should never reveal what his political views were. And indeed, he prevented me um, from being very active in politics at an early age. So I was allowed to stuff envelopes in an office somewhere, but not actually not go outside. out on the doors yes. steps so that nobody could identify his political views through me. OK, so um, 
you get educated and you go to Oxford where you meet your husband. Indeed. Benazir yes. Bhutto. <laughs> Wasn't my... Yes, yeah, Benazir Bhutto introduced <laughs> us, yes. We are wide here, <laughs> wide broad church, but perhaps not that wide yet. Yes. yes. No, Benazir, I was introduced to Philip by, uh, by Benazir Bhutto, so yes. We'll talk about husbands and how useful they can be later, but... <laughs> <laughs> Why did you go into politics? Um, well, politics is something that, uh, at a quite a young age, I mean, when I was at school, I sort of thought that politics was something that interested me, so it just sort of captured me. And I suppose it was about primarily about making a difference. I mean, that sounds a bit trite, but it is genuine. And you can, as an, you know, in the political world generally, but as a member of parliament, you make a difference to your constituents and your constituency, and obviously in government, you're able to make a difference more broadly. Um, and I think being part of the debate as well. Right, now, at the moment, you stand one of the rare women, I think virtually the only Mrs. T before you as the head of a, a, a great, Office of State, but uh, in 1992, you made your first attempt, correct? Indeed, yes, yes. Tell us about that. <laughs> Northwest um, Durham. Northwest Durham, <laughs> yes. Well, for those of you who are, have been through the selection process and are in a seat that is perhaps not as promising as some other <laughs> seats are, um, it's that part of that initiation process. Um, and I, had, I was applying to seats, any seats that came up, really, that, at that stage. Uh, I'd only recently gone onto the candidates list a couple of years um, before the election. I went onto the candidates list and uh, applied for all the seats that came up. Northwest Durham came up. I applied for it. Um, I uh, was uh, interviewed. I have to say that the... Um, I'm trying to think that the number of people... Uh, we went up to the interview. And it, it was in somebody's home, so I was interviewed in there front room, which isn't um, what you quite expect. You're expecting, you know, you're trying to become a candidate. You imagine hordes of people <laughs> interviewing you somewhere, but I was interviewed in front room, so there weren't that many. And then I think there were 12 people at the final interview, at the final uh, selection process. So you get the picture of an association that wasn't that um, strong. Uh, but it was great, it was great fun, uh, but very hard work, but a very good experience because actually it teaches you whether you can do it. You know, being a candidate for a campaign, which is a minimum of three weeks, uh, at the actual election campaign, let alone the, the nursing of the seat, but that election campaign where you are the candidate, it's physically quite tiring, it's mentally quite tiring, and actually you need to be able to do that. And fighting a no-hoper seat, as I was, <coughs> actually tells you, yes, you can or no, you can't. And, and also whether you enjoy it or not. And whether you enjoy it or not, yes. Um, and then, only two years later, you stand in a by-election against Margaret Hodge. Indeed, yes, How in Barking. <laughs> barking. <laughs> barking, that was... Um, two stops past Dagenham, yes. Two stops past Dagenham, yes. And, and unfortunately, Screaming Lord Such, the late Screaming Lord Such, um, wanted to, always said he wanted to start, stand in Barking, because then he could talk about being Barking mad. Um, <laughs> But in fact, there were three. There were three by-elections. That was uh, there were three by-elections in East London on the same day. So there was um, the uh, Barking by-election, Dagenham, and um, one of the other. Um, I'm trying to remember the uh, the other seat uh, nearby. Um, and so there were three of us can uh, three candidates. One of whom is also in the cabinet now, Philip Hammond. Uh, and uh, it was quite collegiate because we had a single office for the campaign. Right. And um, so we were all together. So we were able to kind of share experiences. And, and was that helpful? I mean, in a word, in a way, talking to the girls with the ladies with the blue rosettes, is that helpful because you have that to bounce back on? You have somebody else who's in the same boat very close to you. Yes, and you can share experiences and, yes. and laugh at some things that have happened and so forth. And it's, that's why I think um, the, the City Seats initiative yes. for people who haven't stood before is actually very good because you're there in a group so you can support each other before you actually go to being just the candidate in one particular seat. Can I ask you, what's the sort of most ridiculous question you've ever been, ever been asked by a selection committee? Oh, goodness me. <laughs> um, I find that quite difficult Strange, to answer, the actually. Strangest. I'm, I'm not sure I've... I've um, 
Um, well, I do remember, I'm not sure this is the strangest, but I do remember going to the, um, this is a, a story, I, I um, was being interviewed in Kensington and Chelsea, and I walked into the, uh, the interview, and I'd previously the, the, um, not been selected in, in um, uh, Ash, um, Ashford, uh, and uh, the, uh, one of the people there in the last three was David Cameron, and uh, he didn't win that one. Damien Green defeated him in that yeah, one. Really? Yes. Interesting. And uh, then we, they, very shortly afterwards, I went into the Kensington and Chelsea um, selection, and one of the people sitting around the table on the executive doing this selection interview was David Cameron. <laughs> um, but somebody else actually asked me, he said, it's a new, con uh, that because there have been boundary changes, he right. said, now sort of uh, describe for me, draw for me what the outline of the, uh, what the, the, the exact details of the outline of the boundaries of the constituency are. <laughs> <laughs> and I sort of uh, muttered something and, um, and uh, I knew there was a map on the wall behind me. <laughs> and I was dying just to sort of turn around and sort of, yes, and turn around. <laughs> So I failed that, uh, that <laughs> test, I'm afraid. And then Maidenhead. Yes. Now, Maidenhead, you made it. Do you, I mean, are there any tips you could pass on here about, I mean, we know that this is not an exact science. We know that people are choosing people and, you know, she's blonde or you're not having her or, you know, whatever. Um, what do you think made the difference at Maidenhead? Well, there's, there's um, one thing I would say that is intangible, really, okay. and it was said to me when I failed, um, when I was, had previously been going, the, the, the time when I was selected in North West Durham, I'd done some London selections as well, and one of the London selections, which I didn't get, um, Ian Taylor, who was the president of the association, came out and said to those of us who'd failed, he said, don't worry, somewhere out there is a seat with your name on it. Mm. It's just a question of finding it. And, um, and there is something that you can't quite put your finger on where you actually connect and click with a particular seat and a particular group of people in a seat. Isn't that interesting? Which is interesting. And, and somebody else, another, an, an agent actually in the party said to me, you will probably get a seat which has got a main sort of urban area and a little bit of rural hinterland. And it's exactly what I got in terms of Maidenhead. Isn't that interesting? Which is interesting. But I also think in Maidenhead, um, and remember, the party has changed since, and the, you know, a lot of work's been done on the selection process. Sure. But at that stage, I think one of the differences in Maidenhead was that there were a lot of people in the selection committee. The average age of the selecting people was slightly lower than in some associations. And also, there were more people who, I would say, were connected, a lot of people who ran their own businesses, who were, um, or were um, quite senior in business. They were in a business environment where they saw women in a different role. Ah, that's what I was going to come to, because yes. of women. So yes. they had seen women, not as the secretary, but as, a, as an equal, as somebody who was yes. working alongside them very often. And there were women in the audience who had set up their own businesses and were being very active in business. <laughs> right. So they had perhaps a slightly different approach. And time, of course. And, I mean, yes. And, and starting organisations like this, of course, all of that. Yes. yes. OK. Now, is there a tip? Obviously, you have to get on with your local chairman, your agent. But is there somebody in virtually every constituency, do you think, if you get her or him on your side, you will be a happier bunny? <laughs> I mean, you know, is, is there someone, either the person who actually does everything, you know, the Anne of the local association, who, you know, <laughs> no, no, Anne, don't, no, no, we know you do everything. It's all right. We know you're God. Um, is there somebody that you say, look, yes, of course, there are these obvious big fish in this relatively small pond, but if you get on with the vicar's wife or the so-and-so, this makes a difference. Any suggestions? Gosh, well, I think, I mean, I, you've almost put your finger on it, Eve. I mean, I think, you, you know, you need to get on with the person who does all the work. <laughs> because if they're doing all the work, they, they, you, want, you need them actively to want to do that work for you. Yes. So, there will so be they'll be doing, it for, they'll be doing it for the party, but you also yes. want them to actively feel that they're doing it for you as well. Um, but I mean, I think the, the important thing is to, th there's, a, there's always a great challenge, and it's, of course, when you're in a seat which has got perhaps a very small association and not much of a structure, um, it becomes 
can become sometimes more of a challenge because you're, you have to, by definition, you're working in a voluntary organisation where people are giving their time freely um, to be able to, to do this, giving it because they believe in the Conservative cause, but as I say also, you want them to actively want to, to help to get you elected so and to work for you. So you need to turn up and help them So you need to be, you, you do need to be willing to do all those sorts of things, yes. that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and muck in and actually be part of the organisation. Yeah, I think, I think that's a very important uh, lesson. Um, what about... Uh, the, the interesting thing about being a woman, shall we talk about that? Because I've been a woman in the man's world, you are a woman. How important, how difficult is that now by comparison to when you started? I think it, I think it is different now. I think it has changed. I think the party has changed in terms of its attitude to women. Um, so, and, and a lot of work's been done uh, with not just the... Uh, um, you know, the party and its selection processes and trying to make sure that those are more equal and, and don't have an unconscious bias within them. Obviously, there is the support of Women to Win, which <laughs> has now been going for um, quite a number of years uh, and uh, providing very practical and helpful support to uh, people and continuing to do that. So I think there is, a, there is a different attitude now. But I think but the challenges and the expectations of candidates are actually, have actually increased. So the amount of time that a candidate is expected to spend in a seat is, has increased. Oh, right. I think the, uh, for a candidate who is in a, seat that, a marginal seat that you're fighting to take, then uh, the amount of time you, you now spend in that seat is, has gone up right. from in, in past. And so that puts extra pressures on people. And the other thing, which is always one of the things that people rarely talk about but is important of course is the financial pressures that on somebody fighting a seat as a candidate can really be quite um, quite difficult because you may have to give up your job for a month you or may more. have to yes yes and uh, what about a husband does a husband hand in this <laughs> <laughs> i've only had two but you know <laughs> well you know they come in useful yes <laughs> And can you say, I mean, does he, obviously gets very involved, I'm told, and he will, if necessary, he'll come and, now you're a grand lady, but when you were starting, did he come in and help muck in and do yes. things? Yes, um, I'm, my husband has been interested in politics as well, so, and he's chaired a Conservative Association, so he knows, he's been an officer of various sorts in the Conservative Association, so he knows what it's like, so he understands the sort of, that um, very practical end of it, and also some of the pressures and tensions that come in the association. Now, other tips. I, I think I have read every interview you have ever given, because I'm a bit like you. You read the bed boxes. I'm doing this. I've got to read everything. And you're a bit like, um, I don't know anything about you, which I think is really clever. I mean, I'm the mother of a child who's now on television. People may know my daughter's Claudia Winkleman. And I said, you can go to, you know, she has to go to interviews, as you have to. I mean, the Guardian's in love with you. I mean, they interview as many times as you'll stop on the pavement and give them a chance. Yes. Um, they're terrified of another woman, aren't they? But anyway, um, and all you know about her is who she's married to, how many kids she's got, and she likes having fake tans. What I know about you is that you're married, you've been very successful, a bit about your background, and nothing else. Bloody brilliant, if I may say. <laughs> a little bit about your shoes. <laughs> Just enough. Um, is that a plan? No, it's not a plan. It's just me, <laughs> I think, is the, is the honest answer. Um, it's not a thought-out thing at all. It's just how I, uh, how I am. But it's very, very clever. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, as a journalist, let me say, because... You appear willing, I mean, you know, in being interviewed by The Guardian can't be, you know, a bit of a laugh. And, um, and there you are, and you talk, and you're nice, and you charm them, as you're charming everyone tonight. But they still don't know anything more about you, and off they go, and they, you know. I think the nearest thing, Alison Pearson found out that you liked um, Jamie Oliver more than Delia Smith. <laughs> I think that's the sort of information that, perfectly okay. So you could, I mean, it's just very, very interesting for those people who are going to... 
don't be too open right now because later it may come and hit you mm. in the teeth and you have not got that. We'll talk about later in a minute. Um, <laughs> do <laughs> I mean told I've got to wound up in a minute. Can I just ask you, you're very interestingly, you are the most um, hardworking person in terms of family. The eldest daughter, the only daughter, we work hardest. Um, do you care that perhaps the man's world doesn't get you? Um, I think, if, if I'm interpreting the question correctly, yes. and I think one of the, I've got a, a slight bee in my bonnet, well, I think one of the challenges for women in politics, I think it's a challenge for women in business, and indeed in any um, area of activity, is to be able to do the job as themselves and not to feel they have to do it in the way that the men expect it to be done. Right. And so that's, I, I think I have had a slightly different approach in the political world. When I went into the House of Commons in 97, it, there was still a slightly clubby atmosphere to it. Um, and you know, some feel there's an expectation that you join in that. I, my view is you just get on with the job and do the job. Sure. And don't try to feel that you have to fit into a model that somebody else has set for you. Because it's a model really you can't fit into because you, you, you can't don't have fit the correct into. equipment no. between your legs. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I felt that but too. You, um, I have to ask you about um, the future. Any future plans about new jobs, perhaps after the election? <laughs> The only, future, the only future plan uh, is to uh, work to make sure we get a Conservative majority government elected. <laughs> <laughs> Theresa, that's why you work so well. Can I wish you every success? And, uh, um, and may I say how well you do it, because any day your particular job can explode, can't it? The police, immigration, it's not like there's a plan. Foreign Office, they know when their big days are, you don't. So thank you for handling it so well. <laughs> Um, ladies and gentlemen, Theresa, shall we ask her any questions? Um, Could I, you tell us who you are? I'm Alison Frost, and I read a very interesting book recently called Why Women Don't Run, which is about American, about the American elections, and uh, written by an American academic who studied women at all levels in the American political system. Um, and some of the results are quite interesting about how uh, Sarah Palin had more photographs of Ryan Thompson comments on uh, what she was saying and how the media focused on Hillary Clinton's pantsuits and her not having any ankles. But one of the significant uh, bits of it that stuck in my mind was that even when women are better qualified and more successful than male counterparts, they're still thought to be less able to do a job. <coughs> Well, I, I mean, I, I was going to say that I think the women in this room disprove that theory. I think one of the, but I think one of the problems is this, and it slightly touches on something, an answer I gave to a question from Eve uh, towards the end of the interview, is that is this thing that it's it's not necessarily that people think women are less able, but they think women should be doing the job in the way that they, the men, are doing the job. And very often it's that there are, a woman may have a different skill set or a different combination of skills in their skill set and therefore approach the job in a different way and do it in a different way. It doesn't mean it's being badly done, it just means it's being approached in a different way. And I think one of the great challenges is making sure that everybody just widens their thinking and recognises that it's the, it's the capabilities that one should be looking at, not whether you fit into the stereotype that you're going to do any particular job in a particular, in a particular way. And I think that, as I said earlier, I think that goes not just for politics, I think it goes for business, I think it goes for any area in which women are trying to succeed, that very often we'll do something, we'll do the job, do it equally well, uh, but with different skills, which are equally valid to the skills that the men have, but sometimes, they don't see that. Mm -hmm. With a very male orientated media. Yes, yeah. that's probably, yes. Congratulations on a brilliant day today. Um, what's your most
most memorable door stop experience? Door stop experience. Can you share that with us? Um, gosh. Um, I'm not uh, sure. We'll set aside all the, 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 the people with virtually no clothes on who want <laughs> seats on the doorstep. Um, I mean, I mean, just the little things, like, you know, it's the things that can happen all the time, like the, the, the chap who opened the door to me once with the sort of hand on, on the dog and looked at me and said, are you a Tory? And I said, yes. He said, then the dog can have you. <laughs> and threw this dog out and slammed the door. So, and he was a very nice dog, and he, the dog just kind of looked at me in a sort of, oh, what do we do now? Sort of I had a Tory last week. Yes. <laughs> Think of all the candidates here. Think of all the choices they've got in their constituencies. Um, all the constituencies. Do you, would you advise them to be trying to run a positive campaign about what they would do in their constituency, or would you be following slightly more the national scale, which is all about running a bit of a negative campaign about what you might fear if you ended up with the Labour government? What advice would you give to the candidates here? Well, I mean, the, the uh Nationally, we're also actually running a positive campaign about what we would do as Conservatives in, in government. But I think it's right that nationally we do remind people about what would happen if Labour in government. But I'm a great believer as a, as a candidate in running a positive campaign. I think what people want to know is what would you do for them. Um, so where you've been a Member of Parliament, you can refer to what you've already done and what you will do in the future. As a candidate, um, if people have been, in, in, uh, been selected for a reasonable period of time. They'll have some examples of how they've worked with local groups and so forth. Um, but showing what you would do and how you would work for people, I think, is important. So that positive campaign at a local level, I think, is, uh, is, in, is w what uh, candidates should be looking at. I can ask you a work-related question, and I know it's a huge topic, but you're going to go, OK, I'll just a couple of minutes on. We've all been watching uh, what's been happening in the Sacramento State, and we've seen a response by Georgia government. What indications does that have for the security of our country? Well, the, um, the rise of ISIL has obviously been significant, and they are, as we have saw yesterday with what happened to the Jordanian pilot, a, a barbaric and brutal force. Um, but we'd seen that previously also with the various um, beheadings, including obviously of, of English, British hostages. Uh, the threat level for the United Kingdom was raised last August. It's done independently. Ministers don't decide it. It was raised to severe. That means that a, a terrorist attack is highly likely. Uh, and we have to be ever vigilant in relation to that. But we also have to do what we are doing, which is look to ensure that we have the full powers necessary to be able to deal with the, uh, with the threat. That's why we're putting the CT and um, uh, Counterterrorism and Security Bill through. Um, Parliament at the moment, um, and it's nearing its final stages so that uh, we enhanced our powers to be able to deal with those who are returning ha from, say, Syria, having undertaken terrorist-related ac activity and disrupt, uh, greater powers to disrupt those, are going, those who are going. But as the IRA used to say that the terrorist only has to get lucky once. Yeah. Yeah. And our security services and police <coughs> are, you know, have to be vigilant every, uh, every day uh, in the work that they're doing. So it behoves government to make sure they've got the powers that they need to be able to do what uh, the job that they, they're doing for us. I use toilet newspapers, as you know. What would really, really work, and Labour always used to do this better than Tories, I don't think anybody's doing it now, is case histories. Mm. So what you really want is someone to say, well, actually, this is what Duncan, Owen Duncan Smith did, or this is what so-and-so did, and actually we went out to work, and actually changed my life, and actually made my... And that's what newspapers need. Mm. I would love to think there was a little group of people in Tory headquarters doing it, but I don't believe there is. I leave it to you. <laughs> I'm not sure you expect me to answer that question, no, actually. If, probably, I, would, if I would it's, do, I would pass I, that I, on I, tomorrow. I, yes, well, I, I think it is true to say that the party is aware of the, of the value of people being able to say from their own experience yeah. what, the, what the decisions taken by the government and, have actually and meant to them. newspapers love it, fed up on a plate, <coughs> nicely wrapped, ready to go, preferably looking attractive as well. <laughs> That's all I can say. I'm Beth Prescott, and before you ask, no, my dad does not own two Jaguars. <laughs> um, I, am the, I was recently selected as the candidate for Normanton, Pontefract and Castleford, which means I'm actually going up against the shadow Home Secretary, Yvette Cooper. <laughs> 
Now, I know what you're thinking. She's young, she's northern, she's working class. Has she walked into the wrong room by mistake? Um, I often get comments like that. People come up to me saying, Beth, you know, for those reasons, how can you be a conservative? Do you know what I turn around and say to them? I say, for those very reasons. As a young person, I want to be part of a movement that has a plan to secure the long-term future of our country. That is the Conservative Party. As a northerner, I want to be part of a movement that is creating a northern powerhouse. That is the Conservative Party. As a working class lass, I want to be part of a movement that makes sure that work pays no matter what your background is. That is the Conservative Party. What did the Conservative Party do with a working class lad from Brixton? It made him Prime Minister. What has it done with a working class lass from West Yorkshire? It's given her an apprenticeship. It's given her a job. It's given her a run at Parliament. It's given her a run at a dream. The Conservative Party is and always will be the party of hard working people. Thank you again. <laughs>